Well, this is our last sermon for 2019, and uh, I figured what better way to do this than to, to have a sermon on the Alpha and Omega, considering, and I probably should have switched around Omega and Alpha because we're at the last sermon, we're getting ready to kick off 2020, but, you know, Alpha and Omega works because you know that that's one of the titles of our Lord and Savior, right? Jesus Christ, he's the Alpha and Omega. So would you please stand with me one more time? We've got a chunk of scripture to read here. It's from Revelation 22, verses 1 through 17. And this is what it states. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations, or were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Now, that's shouting news right there. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto the, his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then he said unto me, See that you do not, as you do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth that say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your word and for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and Omega, the one who uh, is there for us. And I thank you that he is making intercessions even right now for us. And I pray for everyone in this place and those that may be listening online, that you would guide and direct us, that you would teach us your word, your will, and your way. May you be glorified in our lives. Father, I pray for freedom right now. Maybe there's somebody in this, here, in this place or listening that, that needs freedom from a bondage. And I just right now, I break those bondages right now in the name of Jesus. And, Father, I thank you that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I thank you for the Alpha and Omega. He's the one that starts our beginning. He knows the end of our days. And I thank you, Lord, for, for guiding us every day in between. We love you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to start out with an account of an elderly gentleman. He had trouble hearing and he, where he could barely hear at all. He was at the point where he could barely hear at all. And finally, he went to a doctor and was fitted, excuse me, for a set of hearing aids that fully restored his hearing. And a month later, he came back in for a checkup, and the doctor said, your hearing is perfect. Your family must be really pleased that you can hear again. He said, oh, I haven't told them. I just sit around and listen to the conversation. I've changed my will three times. <laughs> Do you know the Lord hears everything that we say? And not only that, not only does he hear everything that we say, he knows every thought that we have. He knows us inside out. He knows our motives. Even when we may not know our motives, he knows our motives as well. He's not surprised by anything that we do. He may be saddened by what we do, but he's not surprised. But he knows everything that we think. And you know that the Lord desires for us to walk in righteousness. Let 
not only does he de- desire us to walk in righteousness, but he's given us a way uh, that we can do that. We can walk in righteousness and holiness before him. He set be- uh, before us paths of righteousness that lead to everlasting life. So he's given us everything that we need to do that. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, and why it's important for us as believers. And um, the last chapter of the Bible wraps up the beginning of the Bible, actually, Genesis. And, you know, there's, a, there's called a law of, of first mention of different things, and we're going to look at something that's mentioned first in Genesis, uh, and that is the tree of life. In Genesis 2, we find the tree of life, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But our first point this morning is in the beginning and in the end. Revelation 22, 1 and 2, we just read, says, And we sh- he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. I'm going to stop right there before we get to this next verse. In, in the New Jerusalem, there is a, a throne that sits in the New Jerusalem. There's water that comes out of this thing, and, and it's clear as crystal, and it, separate, it, it goes down the middle of the street, and there's a tree of life on each side. Verse 2, it says, In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Did you see that? It has fruit that's bared every single month. That means that it's always what? Fruitful. You can always get something from it. We're kind of be, we're supposed to be like that always producing fruit. We're not to be fruity, but rather we're to be producing fruit. Amen? So we've got this tree. It's there, the tree of life. We first see this tree in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, And there he put the man whom he had formed. Can you imagine what that garden looked like? Because God himself planted it. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's a difference between these two trees. One is the tree of life. The other one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis, the, Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from the tree of life. It wasn't forbidden for them to eat from the tree of life. Are you with me so far? The one tree, the only tree they were not allowed to eat from in that whole garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did they end up doing? They ate from that one tree they weren't allowed. So God planted all these trees that are pleasant to the eye, pleasant to eat from. So I'd imagine there was... Uh, all kinds of maybe apple trees, pear trees, uh, orange trees. There's all kinds of bushes and berries and stuff that they could eat from, avocado tr- uh, plants, uh, you, you name it, trees. Those are trees, aren't they? I should know. I've got, I have four avocado trees that I've been working on for over a year now. Started from a seed. That is a fascinating process. You take toothpicks, you put them in there, and you start them out in a glass of water, and then yet transfer them over into a, a, a a small planter, and then I had to transfer them to a bigger one. And I'm at the point now where three of them need to be transferred to a bigger planter. They're outside now. And I'm excited because in four more years, I'll get to eat from that tree. And your pastor's looking forward to it. Where was I at? The tree of life. They were not allowed to eat from the they, they were not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they were allowed to eat from the tree of life. And then we know that man's sin separated him from the Father and the tree of life. Get this, man's sin separated. So God said, Adam and Eve, you're not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know the account. Satan comes in as a serpent, and it, he starts talking to Eve. Notice he didn't go to Adam, but he went to Eve, and he deceived the woman. He said, You know, God knows if you eat from this tree, you'll become just like him. And Eve saw saw that the tree was good, and she decided, I'm going to eat this. And she gave some now to her husband, who was standing right there. Her husband should have manned up before she took that tree or took that fruit and should have said, get out of here, Satan. You know, and but he didn't. And he ended up eating as well. And they both uh, were kicked out of the garden. God comes down to visit with them in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve at this point realize they are buck naked. And God's coming through the garden, and they hide themselves in the bushes. They try and make themselves coverings of leaves, and that wasn't good enough. Genesis 3, verses 21 through 24. 
Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. It's no good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I was talking with my brother-in-law the other day, and he mentioned about the flaming sword. And the law first mentioned there, that, that flaming sword was put in place to keep Adam and Eve from taking from the tree of life. And Jesus ended up sheathing that sword with his life on the cross so that we can partake of the tree of life, who is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we see a number of th- uh, things in this passage we just read. We find the first sacrifice of sin in that an animal was sacrificed to cover Adam and Eve. Now, I have a speculation, and this is just a theory. It's not Scripture. But my theory is, is that God slayed a lamb to cover Adam and Eve. And the reason I think that is because Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was slain from the foundation of the world. And I believe that that lamb skin was used to cover their sin, so their nakedness, if you will. And then we also show we in this passage uh, in, in Genesis, we find God's mercy. You see, by not allowing them to eat from the tree of life, God spared us from having to live forever in this body of sin. Did you catch that? By not allowing Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of life, he spared us from having to live forever in this body of sin. And this body's not getting any better, is it? Not until we are redeemed completely when we have our new bodies from upon high. We also see God's grace. You know, God could have destroyed Adam and Eve at that point when they sinned. But instead, he showed them grace and mercy. He allowed them to live, and he chose to redeem them instead. And also we see God's wisdom. God's wisdom kept Adam and Eve from the tree of life as well. And, you know, excuse me, there is wisdom in not getting everything that we want. There's wisdom in that. There are things, you know, you get past that that really, I've got to have this desire, and later on in life you're like, I'm so glad I didn't get that because it could have been really bad. I want to, it reminds me of this story. I want to tell you this. There were several men in a locker room, and all of a sudden they were startled by a phone going off on one of the benches, and the guy sitting there, he picked up the phone, put it on speaker. He said, hello. And the woman's voice on the other side said, dear, are you still at the gym? He said, well, yes. She said, well, I'm at the mall right now, and I found this beautiful dress. It's just perfect. It's $1,500, though. Can I get it? And, And the guy said, well, if you like it that much, go ahead. She said, thank you. Oh, and by the way, I stopped by the Audi dealer, and they've got a car. It's just perfect for me. It's just perfect. And I really, he said, well, how much is it? She said, it's $60,000. He said, well, for that price, make sure that you get every, with all the extras, all the bells and whistles on it. She said, really? He said, yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Oh, and, and one last thing. The house that we were looking at last year, it's back on the market it's $950,000. You know, and he said, well, you can offer them $900,000, but, and, and you can haggle for, you can go from there. So, well, you know, work it from there. Go ahead and make the bid, but $900,000 and, and then negotiate from there. Oh, she was delighted. She said, okay, I'll see you later. I love you. He said, bye, I love you too. And then the man hangs up. The other men are just standing around, jaws almost hitting the floor. And the guy just smiles. He says, now, whose phone is this? (laughs) Oh, in the beginning, we find the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And man was permitted to eat it before he sinned against God. And once sin entered the picture, then God cut man off from the Garden of Eden and access to the tree of life. Now, fast forward a few thousand years in Revelation 22.2. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river was there the tree of life, in which bare twelve manners of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You know, God never changes. 
His desire is that man eats from the tree of life. That was his desire in the beginning. That's his desire in the end. He had to put that on hold, that desire for man to eat from the tree of life, until the end of this dispensation. One day soon, we will have access to that tree. This past week, I lost a dear lady. Um, One of my good friends, his mom passed away. It was unexpected. But the good news in all of this is the fact that she knew the Lord. Well, let me rephrase that. She knows the Lord. And she's standing in his presence right now. And, you know, life doesn't, isn't always uh, rainbows and unicorns. Bad things happen, and death is part of life. And when Adam and Eve sinned, that brought in death. But we have good news in that when we put our faith and trust in Christ, we can stand before him one day and see our relatives and loved ones that have gone on before us that have made Jesus the Lord of their lives. And we can be in his presence and we can partake of that tree of life. And we can drink from that water that runs out of the throne room of God. God never changes. One day soon we'll have access to that tree again. In the beginning, his desire was for man to willingly serve him alone. And in, in, throughout the ages and in the end as well, it's the same. This brings us to point number two this morning. Blessed in the beginning and blessed in the end. Revelation 22, 3 through 7. I love this first part, and there shall be no more curse. I want to stop right there just for a minute. You realize that the curse is what brought in sickness, pain, death, suffering, all the bad things. This is one of the reasons I don't uh, buy into the evolution theory. I believe that the Bible writes it, and, and God put it there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything he made, he looked at it and said it was very good. Evolution says that things get better through pain, suffering, and death. Well, death didn't enter the picture until after Adam sinned, which leaves out evolution completely. That means God had to have made Adam and made him perfect and done everything right the first time. You see, God is very smart. He's not stupid. He doesn't have to use death to make things better. Okay? He, he made things right the first time. And so here we have, uh, in the beginning, there's blessed in the beginning, and there shall be no more curse. Revelation tells us there shall be no more curse. That means there's no more sickness. Hallelujah. There's no more the disease of sin. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. I look forward to that time. We serve him now, but I'm looking forward when we can serve him face to face. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of his holy prophets sent his angel to show in his servants these things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Stop right there. This was written 2,000 years ago. Okay, that means he's coming even faster now. Amen? Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book. When God made everything in the beginning, he looked at it all and said, it is very good. Genesis 131, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And continuing on into chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now I want to bring you back to another scripture that says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And they go, you know, they kind of, that goes together. The seventh day is coming. We have 6,000 years of man's history almost completely behind us. And that seventh day is on its way. The seventh day is a, uh, is a week of blessing. There's a seventh day of, of man's week coming. We call it the millennial reign of Christ. And the millennial reign of Christ is when Jesus comes back from heaven. We come back with him. Now, the rapture's already taken place. We come back with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. He splits the Mount of Olives north to south. There's a chasm that opens up east to west and opens up the eastern gate. And Christ walks through the eastern gate and sets up his kingdom on this earth. His enemies are put beneath his feet. And for a thousand years, there is peace on earth. Hello. 
For a thousand years, there is perfect reign of Jesus Christ, and we rule and reign with him. For a thousand years, there's, it's goodness because the King of kings and Lord of lords is living upon this earth. That is the seventh day, if you will. It's that seven, the 7,000 year period, or the 1,000 year, but it's the seventh day. Are you with me so far? Okay. And one day soon, the Lord will call us home. Prior to that, there's coming a time where the trumpet's going to sound. We find this in in the New Testament. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds with them to be forever with the Lord. We will go into heaven with him. There's a great tribulation that's coming upon this earth in the end, which is real soon. Those of you that joined us for the movie Thief in the Night from the 1970s, You remember, we got a little glimpse of what it might be like. We know that it's coming soon. And in that uh, seven-year trial of tribulation, uh, during the half part of that, there's these two witnesses that come, and they strike the earth with plagues, all kinds of different things. Those two witnesses are murdered out on the streets in Jerusalem. They were hated so much that nobody buries their bodies. They are left out there. They're hated so much that people exchange gifts that these two guys are dead. But they weren't dead forever. Because after three and a half days, the Lord God says, he breathes his life back into them. He says, come up here. And they rise up from the dead, and they go to be with the Lord. And, and, and then there's a great earthquake that happens. 7,000 people die in the city. And many begin to proclaim the Lord. They're like, wow, <laughs> he's really real. You think? You just watch two guys that you hated so much. You murdered and left their bodies in the street, come back to life. And then after all of this takes place, there's a great battle that, that forms. We, call, we know it as the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ comes back. We come back with him, and he takes care of his enemies. Uh, not, in a, you know, he, not like, oh, here, come, let, let me take care of you, but he takes care of his enemies. <laughs> and they're they gone. And he sets up his reign there in Jerusalem. One of my favorite parts about what's coming is that Satan the tempter, the evil one, the wicked one, the liar, is bound in chains and cast into hell for that thousand years. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite parts. Now, he's let loose for a short season after that thousand years, and he gathers some nations together again to go up against the new Jerusalem. And at that point, God says, enough's enough, and he throws them, casts them into the lake of fire where they'll be tormented forever and ever. Not just Satan, but all of those who refuse to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. And I don't say that out of glee because it is a terrible fate. I say that as a, like a father would warn a son not to put his hand on a hot stove iron. Like a mother would warn a child not to touch the curling iron when it's plugged in. I say that because there is consequences to not following after Jesus Christ. I say that because I care about people. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I wish hell wasn't in the Bible. I wish the lake of fire wasn't in there. However, it is. And as one who loves people, I want to warn them of the wrath to come. God is righteous. He's holy. And there is a wrath coming, and we want to avoid that. And he's given us a way of escape. So God, he's coming. Jesus is coming. Um, The rapture is going to happen soon. We need to be ready. I want you to note what Jesus told John. He said, Behold, I come quickly. And that good news was given over 2,000 years ago. We're two two days closer to the trumpet sound, if you will. And we're real close to that seventh day. The blessed day when men will rest from their labors. The blessed day when all things will come under the feet of Jesus. So we don't need to be distracted. Our mission in this world is to stay focused on the Lord, to love him with how much of our hearts? All of our heart, right? We're to love our neighbors as ourselves. We don't want to become distracted. There's an account of an old man. He stepped off the curb and started to cross the street. And a car came screeching around the corner and headed straight for him. For him, and, and alarmed, this man tried to hurry across the street, but the car changed lanes and maintained its collision course. This is the craziest thing this guy has seen. So the man turned around and started to cross back to the curb, but the car switched lanes again. And panicking, the man just froze in the middle of the, the road. The car pulled up beside him, 
The window rolled down, and the driver was a squirrel. See, said the squirrel, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> there is nothing more important than your salvation. And I know it's easy to get distracted like a squirrel on this life. There's plenty of things that will distract us. But, but the truth of the matter is God loves us. Say this with me. God loves me just as much as he loves you. Now, do you believe that this morning? All right. God has provided us a way of escape from his wrath, but it's up to us to take him up on that offer. You know we're called to serve the Lord God. Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You see, those that keep his word are blessed. Now, this doesn't mean that bad things won't happen on this earth because we live in a fallen world. We live in a, a body that's decaying. So don't think that just because the word says you're blessed, that means that there's nothing bad's ever going to happen to you because there's bad things that happen to good people all the time. Amen? Okay. Not that I want to say that you want to go through that, but it just happens. I'll give you an example. The apostles. Did you know that all of the apostles, save one, were martyred? Some of them were sawn in two. That's not very blessed, is it? Some of them, were, they were quartered. Now, that's where they take your, you know, your limbs, all four limbs, and they hook them to horses, and then they send the horses off in different directions. Horses are strong. You, you don't survive that. They, they, they call it quartering for a reason because you end up in four pieces. Some of them were beheaded. That'll bless you. The only one that wasn't martyred was John the Revelator, the one who wrote the book of Revelation. However, history tells us that they tried to martyr him as well. But God wasn't done with him yet. They took some oil, a big vat of oil, and they stuck John the Revelator in it. And then they lit that a fire underneath it. Well, you know what happens with oil when you, when you add heat to it? It boils, right? You ever made donuts? All right, fried chicken? Yeah, we're in the South. Come on, be honest. You make fried chicken, you drop it in a vat of oil, and it fries it nice and crispy. Well, it does the same thing to human flesh. But when they tried that with John the Revelator, they said that there was a smell, a sweet smell of bread in the air, and he wouldn't die. So then they sent him off to the island of Patmos. It was a small island where criminals were sent to live out their days and it wasn't a very good life. It was a rough life. But through, through all these things, we may, it, we're looking at the natural side of things. The natural side of things, we say that wasn't very blessed. But on the spiritual side of things, they got the biggest blessing they could ever ask for because there is a special crown reserved in heaven for those that are martyred for Jesus Christ. They got the highest reward you can get for being that. You see, we need to get our eyes off of the physical blessings and onto the spiritual things of God, onto His blessings, onto what He blesses us with. He blesses us with things like a sound mind, love, and of power. Amen? Good things, good things. God loves us. He's called us to serve Him. Those that keep His word will be blessed forever. They will suffer no more once they have entered into eternity because there will be no more what? Curse. No more curse. No more curse. No more worry. No more fear. No more hunger. No more hatred. No more death, decay, or dander for that matter. It's going to be great. So this leads us to a next point this morning. Rewards in the beginning. Rewards in the end. In the beginning, God gave man the garden. And the reward of his labor was to eat from that garden. But when man sinned, he ended up receiving the reward of his sin. And that reward, we know, was death. Romans 6, 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those that choose to live for themselves will reap the reward or wages of death. And by the way, I want you to know this is not the desire of the Lord. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
How many does God desire to come to repentance? All. That's right. The reward or wages of sin is death. Psalm 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why? Because they will be in his presence forever and ever. They move from a body of sin into the new body that he has prepared for them. But listen to this, Revelation 22, 11 through 13. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I will come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Do you know when Jesus is coming back, when he comes back, he's going to come back with rewards? So my question is, what kind of rewards do you want from the King of Kings? What kind of rewards do you want to be handed from Jesus? I want to encourage you to do this. Build up your treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We don't have to worry about anybody stealing our stuff in heaven. Amen? I'll never forget the first thing that we had stolen from us when we lived in Dazel was a weed eater. And my thought was, you got to work to use that thing. Why would you steal that? Steal something, you know, it's more fun. But the, the, I understand they, it probably ended up at uh, the pawn shop somewhere and, they just got cash for it so they could buy the fun stuff. Anyways. You know, it was a meal time on a small airline, and the flight attendant asked a passenger if he would like dinner. He said, what's my choices? She said, yes or no. <laughs> yes or no in the beginning, yes or no in the end. Adam and Eve had a choice in the beginning to obey the Lord. And their choice of no cost them everything. Their sin opened the door for death to enter. And even though they had made the choice for all people, we still have an individual choice as to whether or not we will obey. So here we are, the end of 2019. Some of you have made the choice, yes, for Jesus. And I'm excited for you. Some have yet to decide. So what will it be for you? Will it be a yes, which means eternal life with Jesus? Or will it be a no to Jesus, which means eternal death? As the praise team comes back, I want you to listen to this final part of our message this morning. Revelation 22, 14, and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The last place you ever want to end up in is outside of the kingdom of God. You don't want to end up there. As you may say, but I'm, I'm not a murderer. The passage there says that murderers end up there. Well, Jesus said that God's standards are so high that even if we hate somebody in our heart, we're guilty of murder against them. But I'm not an idolater. I've, I've never hated anyone. I'm not an idolater. Honestly, if we look at our lives, has Jesus always been number one? If not, then we're guilty. You may say, I, I'm not a liar. Do you know that just telling one lie makes you a liar, just like murdering one person makes you a murderer? Here's how bad it is. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we find this in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That means you could have kept all of the law, all of your life, every single point of it, but only told 
one lie, and you're guilty of breaking it all. My desire is that everyone that I come in contact with, my desire is that they would make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their lives. And this morning, just like every morning, the choice is yours. The choice to say, yes, I will surrender my life to Jesus, that I may live forever with him. Or the choice to say, no, I don't believe you. I'll just take my chances. May I tell you this? We're not promised tomorrow. Please make the decision to follow Jesus today. We're at the end of 2019. And today may be the end of your journey here on this earth. I think of my friend's mom. This was completely unexpected. They were not they, they, completely out of the blue. And she was gone within a matter of days. Some don't have the luxury of knowing that their time is short. Some it just happens like that. If you haven't made that decision to follow after Jesus, would you do so today? Would you please stand with me? As the praise team leads us in a song, I want to open up these altars. Maybe you want to surrender all to Jesus. I'd love for you, I would love for you to come talk to me or just spend time at the altar. If you need a touch in your body from the Lord, I'd love to pray with you about that. Or if you just want to come and spend time with the Lord at these altars this morning, would you do that? There's This is a great time as we're together here, as the Spirit of the Lord is here. It's a great time to, to talk to Him and be ministered to by the Lord. Would you come?
Let's go before the Lord one more time this morning. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for being with us. No matter where we go, wherever we place our feet, that you are there beside us. Your rod and your staff, they guide, they comfort us. And no matter whether we're on the mountaintop or in the valley, that you are there. And that you're walking with us and giving us wisdom and everything that we need to do and say. And Lord, I pray for those in this place and those that are listening online that uh, if there's a need for Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation that today would be the day of freedom for those that may be bound by any sin, a habitual sin, that today they would be set free in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for giving us wisdom and reaching the lost when we're reaching out to people and giving us insight on how, what we should say and do. And Father, as we reach up to you as well, that you, you uh, grant us your presence, and I thank you for giving us a place and home and glory with you. We love you, Father, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. We could use some help setting up tables and chairs for the agape meal. With that being said, you are dismissed. We'll see you in a few minutes at the agape meal.